Okay, so uh, thank you very much for the introduction and thanks for, uh, to the organizers for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to speak here. Um, so in the previous talk, Professor Arthur said uh, he's known Professor Labesse for 50 years. Um, as the youngest speaker at this conference, I cannot make that claim, um, but I have definitely spent uh, many hours in graduate school <laughs> reading Professor Levesque's many, many long papers and oftentimes wishing they were written in English uh, just because I'm so much slower at reading French. But um, thank you, Professor Levesque, for the decades of wonderful math and thank you for being the director of this uh, wonderful research center that brought many mathematicians together and happy birthday. Okay, so... Today I'm going to talk about um, uh, a series of papers I wrote, uh, some of them joined with Amari Obe and some of them joined with uh, Suzuki. Um, okay, I need to figure out which board. So you said, is this board? This board, but, oh, this one. Ah, ah, okay, right. Yes, okay, so I will start with um, okay, this is a good height for me <laughs> to start with. So, um, since there are many young people in the, in the audience, I think I will start with um, a quick intro to uh, what I mean by local Lalonde correspondence. Uh, firstly, is this uh, font size good? People can see, right? Okay. Okay, so, um, so local Lalonde conjectures, um, they are, they give a certain relation between two sides. So on the one side, okay, maybe I should raise it a bit higher. Um, on the one side is what people often call the group side, uh, which are, uh, which consists of irreducible, smooth representations of Okay, some connected reductive algebraic group. So this is a connected uh, reductive algebraic group over some non-Archimedean local field. So F is a non-Archimedean local field. And we consider uh, irreducible smooth representations of GF on the other side uh, is what people in classical Lalande often call the Galois side. Oh, maybe these are slightly too far apart. Sorry. <laughs> Let me bring it. Okay, so this is good. Okay. So Galois side. So these are uh, consists of L parameters. So what I mean by L parameters is that these are um, continuous homomorphisms from, okay, oftentimes denoted by phi, from the V group of F cross SL2C to, so usually you need to put the L group of G here, but for simplicity, I'm gonna assume my groups are split. So I'm just gonna go put uh, G check, the complex dual group, so this is the group whose root datum uh, is like the co-root datum of G. Okay, so um, if, uh, so there are many people in the audience are more familiar with geometric Lalande, so I think people have different per terminology for the group side. In geometric Lalande, this is I think called the geometric side or the automorphic side, whereas the Galois side is oftentimes called the spectral side. Okay, so um, the conjectural local Lalande correspond correspondence predicts a surjective map going this way where if you start with some uh, irreducible smooth representation, uh, you're supposed to get some sort of L parameter. So this is the uh, most la naive formulation of the conjecture. And um, firstly, this map is predicted to always have um, finite fibers and I believe uh, very early on, people actually thought this naive formulation, oh, of course, mod isom on this side and mod g check conjugacy. So early on, people believed that this naive formulation would just give a bijection on the nose, but it turns out that's not true because 
the fibers um, are not singletons in general. So. In fact, um, there are not even singletons for, I think, uh, SL2, and I believe this was mentioned in the Corvallis for volume of uh, Langland's Shasta and in Professor Labesse's article there. Um, and of course, for SLN, uh, the fiber is not singleton. So it's, I, um, it's pretty much only a singleton for GLN and, of course, for torus. Okay, so the fibers are uh, now it's called L packets. So fibers, they're L packets. Okay, I guess I don't need an exclamation. Okay. Um, so mathematicians oftentimes want to have bijections uh, because that's a much more elegant way of formulating anything. So um, motivated by this, I guess pursuit of aesthetics, people uh, considered doing an uh, enhancement on the Galois side to make this a bijection. So what you do is to consider enhanced L parameters on the Galois side, and an enhancement is just adding a certain uh, irreducible representation, rho pi, uh, which is an irrep in uh, a certain component group. So starting from each L parameter, you can attach a certain component group which uh, parameterizes the internal structure of the L packets. So here, uh, for simplicity, I can tell you what this group looks like for uh, split groups. So this, uh, this component group is just, uh, okay, it's given by the centralizer of phi inside G check and you mod out its Identity component. Okay. Um, so, uh, so when you add the enhancement and you consider enhanced L parameters, then uh, the conjecture is that you do get a bijection between the group side you consider E G, and the Galois side you consider uh, L parameters with an enhancement. So you put a subscript E here to denote the enhancement, and this is the conjectural bijection. Okay, so many people in, in the audience have worked towards um, proving the, local, the classical local Langlands conjecture, and uh, let me just... Ah, sorry. Ah, yes. Uh, is that okay? Okay, yeah, sorry. I, I, I did say that I did, I, yeah, okay. Um, and my arrows should really be horizontal to the board, but, okay, okay. Okay, so many people in the audience have worked towards the local Lamas conjecture. Let me just give uh, like a very uh, incomplete, brief uh, overview of the history. Okay, so. So these ones are manual uh, adjustment. Okay, so, um, okay, brief history. So the local allowance for, um, okay, so I guess the first case was uh, due to, uh, so it was for GLN, and it was first proved in the local function field case by Lamont, Rappaport, and Stuhler, uh, their proofs use a uh, similar, follow similar strategy as Dreamfeld's proof for GL2. And uh, later, uh, Henniart, I believe this is in the 1990s, I think, or 80s. Um, where uh, Henniard gave a proof of local allowance for GLN using uh, his earlier proof of the numerical local allowance, if I got the history right. Um, and then later on, Harris Taylor um, gave a different proof of local allowance for GLN using. Ah, okay. So, okay, thanks for. So, 
They proved it first, and then, okay, and then Henniard gave a different, so Harris-Taylor proof uses geometry of Shimura varieties um, and some sort of a, uh, local global compatibility um, to obtain the local lalons. And then uh, Henniard uh, gave a different proof, uh, simplify, sort of simplifying the, the proof given in Harris-Taylor of local lalons for GLN. Um, and then uh, after that, and then Schultz came along and also gave a different proof, but uh, slightly closer in spirit to Harris-Taylor's proof of local lawns for GLN. Okay, um, so local lawns for SLN is also known. Um, so uh, there's the work of Hiraga Saito uh, for characteristic zero fields and ABPS. Uh, that's Obed, so I really should write it, Obed, uh, Baum, Kleeman, Solovelt, uh, for positive characteristic. Okay, and um, for more general groups, there's also the work of, okay, there's the work of um, Arthur Moglang and possibly many other people for uh, quasi-split ca classical groups. Um, for uh, Characteristic zero. Okay. So pretty much each group uh, has uh, some authors sitting in the audience, which is great. Um, okay. So um, uh, in my joint work with Amari Obe, we're so, so far like all these uh, papers are about classical groups. So uh, Amari and I were the first people to do local lines for exceptional groups. So we did it for G2. Um, but today I'm hoping to illustrate that our strategy is actually general and can be applied in many general cases. Okay, so I think that's the historical overview part. So, okay, what is the general strategy? Um, I'm going to erase this board. So how high does it have to go? So now this one is, okay. So the general strategy is that, um, okay, over. It's basically, it's very simple. It's just um, sort of doing local long lines correspondence piece by piece. So earlier, um, I said we want to prove a certain conjectural bijection between the group side and the Galois side. So um, a very natural idea is to okay, I can continue, is to sort of decompose both sides and do it piece by piece. So the group side, uh, by the work of Bernstein, has a decomposition into Bernstein series. So uh, these are uh, things indexed by certain Bernstein inertial classes, which I will expand on in a second. Um, and what, what these inertial classes are, so this, uh, this is really, if you read papers, this is really mass frac S. And these things are uh, given by a pair consisting of uh, consisting of a levy of G and some supercuspidal sigma of the levy, and then we're taking G conjugacy class of uh, such pairs, levy and uh, orbit of the supercuspidal under twisting by unramified characters. So when I write sigma, I really mean anything in this orbit. 
uh, so any sort of unramified character twist of sigma is allowed, and this is also why sometimes uh, people also just write a pair M and O, so O stands for orbit. Okay, and uh, what are these uh, E, S, G? So this, okay, is this color visible, by the way? Or should I use a different color? Um, so, so these are uh, representations uh, such that uh, people often say uh, that occurs in, so occurs in parabolic induction of sigma, and of course we always allow twisting by some unramified character. So what does occurs mean just means that any subquotient of pi is equivalent to some subquotient inside this parabolic induction. So in other words, you can also say that this is saying that the cuspidal support of pi lies inside this Bernstein inertial class, mass frac S. Okay. Um, so on the Galois side, uh, there is a completely analogous de decomposition. Okay, so now I wish I had moved this down here. Um, okay, so there is a, an analogous decomposition. Okay, let me extend it here. Okay, it's extended. Uh, I just want to move that. Okay. Okay, so if I were giving a Zoom talk, I, I could easily extend it, but now, okay. Um, so there is a, an analogous decomposition due to AMS, so Obe, Musai, and Solovelt, um, into the Galois side analog of Bernstein series. So uh, here, first, we have some Galois side analog of the Bernstein inertial classes denoted by S check inside some sort of Galois side Bernstein variety, um, whose points will give, uh, yeah whose points consist of these Galois side Bernstein classes. And we can consider enhanced L parameters with cuspidal support living inside this Galois side analog of the Bernstein classes. So this is completely analogous to that. So now I need to tell you what are these S check. So just like on the group side, um, it's a certain pair with a levy, so here I need to take M check because I'm on the Galois side, and it's a certain orbit um, of, so it's an orbit of a cuspidal enhanced L parameter under some group of unramified characters on the Galois side of, okay, so this needs to, Okay, so this is, is a certain cuspidal enhanced L parameter. And I'm taking G check conjugacy on this side. So um, what does cuspidality really mean on the Galois side? So now, um, let me, should I write it here? So, um, okay, so I'll, I'll try to write it here. Okay, so, um, so starting from an L parameter, uh, firstly, uh, an enhanced L parameter, phi, and its enhancement, you can consider um, a certain unipotent class inside G check, which is just phi evaluated at this standard unipotent of SL2C. Um, and Lustig, oh. so uh, starting with such a pair, so U, phi, and rho. Here, you, this rho is an enhancement of the L parameter, but you can also really view it as an irreducible representation of um, a certain uh, central, uh, 
component group of the centralizer of this unipotent inside uh, some suitable Galois side group that's attached to this phi. So this, this such a pair, uh, so, so this pair essentially corresponds to uh, a local system Um, so oftentimes denoted by E sub phi. So it's a local system, and it's not so important to know where it's supported, but if you really want to know, it's on the unipotent conjugacy class of this, this U phi. Okay, but the point is, um, so Lustig formulated a notion of cuspidality for these local systems. And when I say this pair is cuspidal, the official definition is that this local system is a cuspidal local system. But that's not very intuitive. And instead, I want to give you a more intuitive um, notion of what cuspidal enhanced L parameter really means. So um, basically starting from this local system, um, and when it's cuspidal, for example, I can consider its associated IC sheaf attached to this local system. And then I can take parabolic induction. So there's a certain uh, parabolic, a Galois side analog of the parabolic on the group side that's attached to phi, and then there's also a certain bigger group also attached to phi. And you can look at the parabolic induction, and whenever I have some sort of simple perverse subsheaf, so this is a, inside this parabolic induction, then I can say that, um, the cuspidal support of this simple perverse subsheaf, which is gonna, firstly, this sheaf corresponds to some sort of enhanced L parameter, um, and the cuspidal support is, uh, is this IC sheaf attached to the local system. So in other words, you can say the cuspidal support of this enhanced L parameter lies inside this S check. So, um, and this, uh, this is what it means for, for, for an enhanced L parameter to be cuspidal. Okay, so uh, this decomposition on the Galois side essentially captures, okay, maybe I wanna use an even different color. No, this is not good, okay. So this captures, um, basically enhanced L parameters, so phi and rho inside phi E G. Ah, this is not enough space, such that, okay, the cuspidal support is in S check. So as you can see, this is completely analogous to what happens on the group side. And here, this, this IC is sort of playing the role of sigma or sigma tensor chi, and on this side, when I take the cuspidal support of pi, I get uh, sigma tensor chi. Okay, so, the, so, so the cuspidality on the Galois side is sort of uh, the analog of super cuspidality on the group side. Okay, so, so now we have this decomposition. So, uh, and the idea becomes very simple. We just need to match these uh, blocks on group side and Galois side piece by piece. So, I guess I can, okay, so. Uh, this might work. Okay, so the point is I want to match this one. Okay. Okay, piece by piece. Um, so, now let me give you the example of, uh, in the case of, for example, G2. Uh, what are the blocks and uh, how to match them? Okay, so, um, okay. This one.
So example, uh, so in the case of G2, um, because G2 is quite small, there are essentially three types of blocks. Um, okay. Ah, okay. So first, we can consider cuspidal support in the smallest possible levy, which is just the torus, and consider some character of the torus. Um, and in this case, the Bernstein series are just the principal series. of G2, okay? In particular, if you take chi to be an unramified characters, uh, this uh, Bernstein series consists of unipotent principal series, okay? And on the other extreme, we have, um, you can take, no, this is the, uh, three. You can take the largest possible levy, which is just G itself, and then take supercuspital of G, and these are, so these Bernstein series are not so complicated. They're, they're super cuspidals of G. And of course, you allow uh, twists by unramified characters. Um, so now <coughs> there's something in between the smallest levy and the largest levy, uh, which is uh, for G2. You can take the levy to be GL2 and then uh, take a super cuspidal on the GL2. So there are essentially two different kinds of GL2, there is one associated to long root and then there's another one for short root. And these Bernstein series are, uh, we call intermediate series. Well, the name really makes sense because it's in between the smallest and the largest levy cuspidal support. So, um, in the case, in the first case for principal series, there's the work of, um, maybe I can use, okay, maybe I'll draw it here. So, so there's the work, so for principal series, there's the work of Roche, where he starts with the group side. Um, he considers <coughs> a bijection between certain simple modules of some Hecke algebra attached to this principal series block. Um, and on the Galois side, we consider enhanced L parameters with certain uh, correct hospital support. And then by the work of reader, so uh, I think in the 1990s, uh, Reader constructs a bijection between uh, the enhanced L parameters and the uh, simple modules of these Hecke algebras, and when you compose these two together, you get a bijection like this. Um, except Reader's work is uh, only for G split with connected center, so there's some restriction. And then later on, uh, by the work of ABPS, um, I already wrote it out there, so I don't need to write out the full name here. So by ABPS, um, they establish this bijection between simple modules on the groups of the group side Hecke algebra and simple mm -hmm. modules of certain Galois side analog of the group side Hecke algebra. And uh, combining this with the work of AMS, okay, so Aubert, Musawi, Solovel. Did I write it? Yeah, I wrote the full name somewhere. Okay, anyway, okay. So um, they're able to basically generalize readers' uh, principal series local allowance uh, for general G and not just G split with connected center. Okay, so uh, in my first paper on heck algebra with Amari Obed, what we did was essentially uh, doing this for intermediate series. And our result not only holds for G2, in fact, it's a general result for uh, non supercuspidal Bernstein blocks um, for arbitrary reductive groups. So let me uh, say what we proved there. Um, ah, I can just erase, I guess I can just erase this, just modify it here. So, okay.
So, um, oh, to erase the word principle as well. Okay. So for intermediate series, Um, the story is a little bit complicated, so let me first put it as dash. Um, so first, uh, there is a conjecture due to ABPS that uh, intermediate series bursting blocks are in bijection with certain twisted extended quotient, but here I'm going to assume like all the co-cycles vanish, so there is no, just going to be, yeah, there's not going to be any co-cycles. Um, but it's going to be in bijection with something that looks like a torus, and it's some sort of cuspidal thing on the levy uh, with a twisted extended quotient modulo this, uh, certain finite extended Vi group attached to this Bernstein inertial class S. So here, uh, I want to say that this is a finite extended Vi group. Um, so it looks like some sort of finite Vi group, uh, semi-direct with some sort of R group. Okay, not sure if the Direction is it's the other way or is this it's okay um, and okay so what this twisted extended quotient really is is you can think of it oh now I regret putting it here because okay you can think of it as um, some sort of it's actually some sort of disjoint union over uh, certain irreducible representations of uh, Okay, something that I will explain in a second. Mod this uh, finite extended Vi group, and you take uh, the you can take the union. So when you take the union, this really becomes a bijection. But um, what what this uh, object is here is you're taking the stabilizer of your sigma, which is your supercuspidal on the levy, twisted by chi, and then you're taking the stabilizer of this sigma tensor chi inside this finite extended Vi group WGS. Okay, and when you uh, take the union over all the unramified characters chi of uh, the Levy M, you really get a bijection, uh, ignoring the cocycle. Okay, and um, there is a completely analogous story on the Galois side, which is that uh, firstly, there is the work of uh, AMS, where uh, they have this bijection between uh, enhanced L parameters with cuspidal support in S check and uh, some sort of levy version of the enhanced L parameter on the levy, twisted extended quotient with, okay, so this is Galois size, so it's very easy, you just add a check everywhere, so I'm considering W, G check, S check. Um, so maybe let me say, uh, in case you're wondering what this WGS really is. This, which board is this? This is the third one, okay. So um, this is essentially the normalizer of like this Bernstein inertial class uh, inside G and then mod the Levy M. So on the Galois side, this is very easy to define. Again, you just add check everywhere. Um, and now, um, this twisted extended quotient is um, also just the union over irreducible uh, representation of, uh, okay, again, it's essentially adding the dual to, to everything on the group side. So what is the dual of the sigma tensor chi? It's uh, my cuspidal enhanced L parameter <coughs> attached to the supercuspidal sigma. So some sort of cuspidal enhanced L parameter and twisted by uh, essentially the image of this chi, uh, which is inside this group of unramified characters um, of M. And then I take the image in the Galois side analog, which is this uh, X N R M check, okay? And then this mod out by 
um, the Galois side analog of the finite extended Y group. So um, fortunately, uh, this first dotted arrow was proved, and now so it's not dotted anymore by Soloveld quite recently. And so we're able to sort of complete this picture by working on this side, which is um, a, a much easier side because you're like really looking at levees and something smaller. And we're able to uh, establish this bijection. So this, this is in my paper with uh, Amarillo Abed uh, on Heck algebra, where we establish a bijection. Moreover, we actually give an axiomatic setup for when this is true. And uh, if one wants to prove local long ones, one can just like verify our axioms. And identifying these, and then we just glue uh, all the pieces together. So gluing, okay. Um, it always takes me a few seconds to figure out which button to press. Okay, and then here, uh, we're also gluing. Um, so this implies, so establishing a bijection here implies that uh, we have this bijection here. So this was in 2022. Um, and then this implies this solid bijection here. Okay. And this is for, for G arbitrary. reductive group. Okay. Um, so we're able to use this uh, general result we proved on Heck algebras uh, to deduce a bijection for intermediate series of G2 as a, as a corollary or special case exemplifying our general result. Okay, so that's, that's for intermediate series. And uh, let me just make a remark that uh, if you're wondering what these like magical maps are, they're essentially um, some sort of, I would say, twisted version of the cuspidal support map. For example, on the Galois side, uh, it's some sort of twisted uh, cuspidal support map. Um, there's a twisting because the, if you are familiar with the usual cuspidal support map, uh, constructed using generalized Springer correspondence, it goes to some sort of torus modulo, some sort of Y group. And here we're like, okay, we do some shenanigans and there's, this is a twisted extended quotient. Uh, but, but there is some sort of generalized Springer correspondence hiding in the background. which makes me think this is very geometrizable or like if you're more into the geometric uh, theory. And I think people, some people have recently start, uh, picked up on this and are like working on it. Okay, um, so that's for intermediate series. So now I need to uh, tell you about principal series. How am I, sorry, supercuspidals. How am I doing on time? Ah. So supercuspidals. Um, which one? Uh, this one. Oh, but then I need to maybe, do I need to raise everything? Ah, okay, that's a good point. So. Given certain axioms, which you can verify by hand, and we verify it for G2, and also for GSP4, for example, and many other groups. It's just, I think we ran out of steam, so we didn't bother doing it. So like some sort of functoriality on the cuspidal local long lines on the levy. For example, compatibility with, for the cuspid, for, so, so for the supercuspidal. So the super yes. Yes, and we, we impose two axioms on the supercuspidal local long lines on the levy, which are satisfied for like many cases and definitely expected to satisfy for all cases. Um, we, we have this. So we give some axioms. So you just need to verify the axiom and you can do local long lines for arbitrary reductive groups. Yeah. 
So, what, so regarding the quality of the law, maybe you should ask you for the truth as all. And on black air, we have a price to offer the truth. Oh, I, it's a different ABPS. ABPS, there are many, yeah, there are many, many ABPS. Same people, but different. Things. Yeah. <coughs> okay. I think if you look in the uh, list of references in our papers, there are probably ABPS 1, 2, 3, 4, or something like that. Okay. It's, I'm not sure. Yeah, I forgot which, which year this is. I guess Amari knows. Yeah. Um, we didn't write. Ah, that's a that's a good question. So so like we do it like series by series. I guess um, we do write down what the enhanced L parameters are, but um, I'm trying to think. Yeah, we write down, for example, the cash stylistic triples for those L parameters. You you can view it that way. That's at least how we wrote it. But like, I don't know if we. Exp like we specifically wrote down all the S checks. Like we just wrote down in just enough for, for our proofs. But, oh, you're, okay, okay. Now I understand your question. So yes, um, let me just bring this board down. Is this the second one? Okay. Okay, I understand your question. You're wondering how to match S and S check. Right, so, so here's how we match S and S check. So S is, M sigma uh, G conjugacy. So uh, we match them via local long lines, uh, cuspidal local long lines on the levy, and we get an S check, which is, uh, okay, I'm assuming everything is split because I really don't want to deal with L groups. Um, and then this is the cuspidal local long lines image of sigma. So it's, you can write it as phi sigma rho sigma. And then you take G check conjugacy in the simplest possible form. And the, the, the axiom you need to verify is, is on this, uh, this association from sigma to phi sigma rho sigma. Mm -hmm. Yes, so there is a list of properties. Yes, uh, there's a list of properties and we, uh, so for our local allowance for G2, we have some list of properties. And hopefully by the end, I will say something about stability. Um, but we also use, for example, uh, formal degree. So there is a property that says that formal degree divided by the dimension of enhancement is constant uh, along an L packet. This is, I think, due to Shahidi. So that's also a property. So there are many, many properties, but perhaps I won't have time to get to them. Yes, yes, yes. But, but there could be a, maybe a different list of properties that you know, some other people might prefer to use. Like, uh, but we do have our list of properties. Is, um, for example, I think maybe Tasho Kalisa has some uh, characterization purely in terms of uh, atomic stability or something, which is, uh, I'm not sure how to compare like, yeah, other, other people's characterization with ours. But we, we, we do have a list of properties, yes. And we don't use L functions or, yeah, we don't use anything to do with L functions. Our, our list does not, it does not include L functions in our, in our list currently, yes. And somehow, at least for G2, we don't need it. So we have enough other, other properties, yeah. So. Okay, uh, maybe let me continue. Um, so I'm gonna move this. Oh, right, I, I remember. I was gonna use that board <laughs> before I switch. Okay. Um, so first, uh, let me say how I think about supercuspitals. For simplicity, I will only give you examples of depth zero supercuspitals. Um, you can, uh, look at higher depth supercuspitals by considering this like twisted levy sequence and then anyway I will only look at a G0 piece. So uh, the way I think about a depth zero supercuspital is basically okay you start with some finite field irreducible representation 
Okay, so what is this fi finite field group? So what happens is if I'm looking at a supercuspidal at depth zero on my group G, what I do is, um, okay, I will find some parahoric subgroup and I will look at, I will look at the reductive quotient of my parahoric. <coughs> this is just the parahoric mod the pro-unipotent radical. It becomes something over finite field. Um, and I will look at some irreducible representation on this uh, finite, finite field uh, reductive quotient of my parahoric. And I will take the inflation and then compact induction, and this gives me my depth zero supercuspidal. So now uh, I just need to tell you, um, in order to describe this supercuspital, I just need to tell you firstly uh, which parahoric or which reductive quotient of the parahoric I'm looking at and exactly uh, which irreducible representation of this, this uh, reductive quotient that I'm looking at. So how do I think of this space now? Um, what I like to do is, okay, so I really like the linguistic theory. So by the linguistic, um, this is 1976 or eight. Um, I, there's a decomposition uh, into, of this uh, space of irreducible representations into the linguistic series. Um, the linguistic series. Uh, indexed by some semi-simple elements. So S is some semi-simple element inside this dual group. Um, and so each, each one is a Delin-Lustig series. But this is still not uh, explicit enough or at least not easy to, to really get your hands on. So what I do next is I look at this, uh, each Delin-Lustig series and I apply Lustig's equivalence, uh, which brings uh, the Stirling Lustig series with non trivial semi simple element to something unipotent. So it goes to the centralizer of the semi simple. And now uh, my, I can look at all the unipotent uh, representations of this, this centralizer. So if I'm trying to find uh, some representation tau of this finite uh, field group uh, that, is, uh, that gives me a supercuspidal after I take inflation and compact induction. I just need to find something, okay, cuspidal here and something cuspidal here. So it, now I just need to find cuspidal unipotent representations of the centralizer. And this thing is usually quite small, at least it's much smaller than your original group. So that makes the task very doable. Okay, so um, in this, uh, in the case of supercuspital, maybe before I give you uh, examples of some very interesting L packets that we found, I should first say, uh, I should mention a series of very important works. So uh, this is, okay. So in the case of supercuspital, there's first the work of the backer uh, reader, so I mean, I mean case three here, okay, case three. The backer reader in 2009, where they consider supercuspital L packets uh, at depth zero. Okay, no, no, let me make more space for myself. So, so okay. Step zero. Supercuspidal L packets. So these packets are purely supercuspidal in the sense that uh, each packet only has supercuspidal members. You cannot have a supercuspidal with a non-supercuspidal in the same L packet. And actually, in today's terminology, the what the backer reader consider uh, are actually regular supercuspidal L packets. So what regular supercuspidal means is roughly speaking, okay, if you're looking, yeah, here they're looking at depth zero, so it just means that you're, okay, roughly that your 
RT theta, the linguistic virtual character is irreducible. Okay. Um, and later on, uh, there's the work of Tasho Kalisa, who's in the audience, and I guess Tasho can go to sleep now. Um, is, so, uh, okay, I will not write down the year because I'm not going to remember. So Tasho first did um, regular supercuspidal L packets at positive depths. So this generalizes uh, the backer reader to all depths. And then in a later paper, uh, Tasho did uh, what's called non-singular supercuspidal L packets. Okay, uh, so uh, all of these works are for arbitrary reductive group G. Okay. So if you want to do arbitrary groups, sometimes you have to sacrifice by only considering supercuspitals. Um, and um, maybe, so the relation between all these different adjectives that you put in front of supercuspital is roughly like this. So you have, okay, regular supercuspital, and then uh, you have a larger class, which is called non-singular. So regular means your RT theta is irreducible, and non-singular means your RT theta can be reducible, but it's still you know, nice enough that it doesn't destroy your, your life. Um, and then there's like more supercuspital that's uh, not non-singular. So these are the ones that we call singular supercuspital. So I believe uh, Amari and I were the first people to kind of say, to give this a name, to call it singular supercuspitals. So these are the ones that are not covered in, in this. Um, and so singular supercuspitals are uh, very peculiar in the sense that uh, they have to mix with um, non-supercuspitals. So I will say these ones have to Mix. You can check that by, by definition. Mix with non supercuspitals. Yeah, but it's, it's really, I, I think, uh, yeah, I can give it as an exercise to, to a PhD student. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Have to mix with now. Uh, okay, depends on the the, the PhD depends student. On <laughs> depends on what I'm. Oh, I'm assuming. So for simplicity, everything in this talk is all split. So I don't want to worry about uh, inner forms and other things. Okay. So um, yeah. So perhaps one needs to refine some of the statements for for more general groups. Um, but. I, because yeah. they have Gaia parameters, uh, Gaia parameters the, the same because they have to have the same Gaia parameters and non supercuspid yeah. And that's uh, a conjecture because nobody knows uh, that Gaia parameters exist. It, it's, it's implied by some other expected property. You, you can, th th that's an exercise. Like, you take some famous person's property, expected, like let's say listed in some Borao or whatever the Siderat, and then this, this one can deduce this. No, I think, for no, I think Okay, we, we can debate that after the talk. But this is definitely true for, for all the cases I've examined so far. Um, and I think one can say something general. Uh, this is, okay, this is a vague approximation of the, yeah, but one can say something in general as well about the, the mixing. Um, so, okay, so at least in the cases that I will discuss, like all the singular supercuspitals will have to mix with non-supercuspitals. And um, let me just give you an example. Um, so, one example is, um, okay. Okay, is, so I can look at a certain family of three by three, uh, we like to call this three by three packets because uh, I will have uh, three different principal series uh, indexed by three ramified qubit characters. So there's 
uh, three different principal theories. Okay, uh, prime, double prime. And um, we will have two families of Dolin Lu sticks. So there's an RT theta that's going to break into three pieces. So there's going to be one, two, and three. And uh, there is another RT theta, which is sort of dual to this one. So maybe, like, in a very vague sense, let me just say some sort of RT theta check. And, um, and this will also break into three pieces. So I will have um, two families of six singular supercuspitals and three different principal series. And um, so these, uh, what's deceptive about these is that uh, like all these representations will have the same formal degree. So just formal degree alone is not enough to distinguish them. So the formal degree is given by, okay, um, okay, let me, so this is Q, uh, divide Q over three, times q squared plus q plus one. Okay, and oh, and I did all this work about telling you about how I think about supercuspitals. I should say what the parahoric is in this case, or rather it's reductive quotient. So this example has a uh, reductive quotient of the parahoric being SL3 over FQ. And then um, the centralizer where I'm, uh, trying to find cuspidal unipotent on uh, is given by, uh, so this is T, so it's some torus semi-direct product with mu three. Okay, and uh, oh, here I guess I need Q congruent to one mod three uh, in this case. So there is another uh, example that's very similar to this, maybe, in the lack of board space, I will write it here. Um, let me bring it up a bit. So, so another case is we have like two families of four representations. So I have a, a principal series attached to a certain quadratic ramified character and then another principal series attached to a different quadratic ramified character. And then there's a, a single RT theta, the linguistic, that's gonna break into two pieces. And I get two such L packets like this. And the formal degree in this case, again, you cannot distinguish these four representations by formal degree, or at least you cannot tell if you should put it this way or rotate these, uh, like switch these two. Um, and that's because they all have the same formal degree and it's given by Q squared, okay, uh, depending on your normalization, but in our normalization it's Q squared over two times Q plus one squared. And uh, in this case my supercuspital is given by um, the parahoric reductive quotient SO4 and uh, the centralizer is given by, okay, can I squeeze it in here? Okay, centralizer is given by uh, torus semi-direct product mu two. Okay, so how do we actually determine uh, whether it should look like this or if I should permute these three dots and permute these three dots, what to do? Okay, so it boils down to basically stability. So what I mean by stability is, I'm always looking for space to write things. Uh, I will write it here because I'm running out of time. So by stability, I mean, uh, okay. So I'm gonna assume, okay. Yeah, so there exists a non-zero, uh, C linear combination. Uh, I, there's not much space, but okay. C linear combination uh, 
so some sort of coefficients with uh, the character of, of pi, and you sum it over all the members of a given L packet, and you say that the senior combination is stable. Okay, moreover, uh, it's expected that you can take this coefficient to be the dimension of the enhancement. And moreover, no proper subset sh uh, of this L packet should have this property. Um, so let me give you some divider so it's clearer. So it's okay. And so <coughs> it turns out that if you try to compute compute the character sums of these uh, representations, um, firstly, um, the most simple computation one could do is to just compute it on topologically unipotent elements which form a uh, neighborhood of one. And it turns out that's not enough because uh, on topologically unipotent neighborhoods, all of these, no matter how you permute them, they're still stable, which is very frustrating. And the same thing is happening here, like on topologically unipotent neighborhoods, you can permute them and they, they're still stable. So we had to work harder and we had to compute them. Um, okay, um, maybe I can squeeze it in here. Uh, we have to compute the, um, what we call, uh, okay, so first, this is a divider line. Okay, I'm gonna write here. Um, so, uh, firstly, neighborhood of one is not good enough because it doesn't give you much information, it's just stable no matter how, how you permute them. Uh, but if you do neighborhood of some other non-trivial semi-simple. So by this, this is really kind of like an abuse of terminology. What I mean is I'm computing characters on uh, elements of this form, S and U, where U, this is a, a Jordan, topological Jordan decomposition, and U is a topologically unipotent element uh, in the centralizer of S. Okay, so for this three by three case, um, for this, this case, I'm taking S to be an order three element such that the centralizer is SL3, and then it just boils down to com uh, computing stable distributions on SL3. And then in this case, uh, I'm taking some sort of uh, order two S, a neighborhood of S, where the centralizer is, is SO4, and then this boils down to some computations about stable distributions on SO4. And fortunately, uh, this was good enough for our situation. We were able to pin down these things. Okay, I think I'm out of time, right? Sorry, sorry for, for going over. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.